Well, welcome uh, to this is the league's second meeting to discuss our new four league position on ways and um, some brief reminders for zoom. Um, I think you should all be muted. I think uh, Ellen was going to mute everybody. Um, and we ask that you remain muted except when asking questions at the end of the meeting. Um, and uh, those of you who were here for a bit already heard me, but uh, if you'd like, uh, use the uh, rename function to add the county where you live. The way you do that is you hover your cursor over your image uh, and you should see three dots. You click on them and you'll get a list of options you can do. And at least on my system, the bottom one is rename. You can just go in and type um, your name, add your county there. Um, uh, we're going to include uh, time for questions and discussion at the end. Uh, feel free to write your questions as uh, you go into the chat. Um, and if you have something to ask or contribute at the end, um, ease, either use the hand raid fu raise function, um, which I think is under reactions, or you might have different systems, but either do that or just raise your hand just like this, and we'll do our best to uh, notice those hands. Um, and um, I think that is, those are all the Zoom points to mention. Um, so we'll get started. Um, we want to start with uh, some brief introductions of us panelists. <clears throat> uh, Nancy Tudor is a member of the Schenectady League with a degree in environmental engineering, who recently retired from the Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory. Um, Tracy Frisch is going to get a bigger introduction right before her portion, but uh, just for now, she's a local expert in the field of waste management who serves on the board of the National Recycling Council, and she has more than 30 years experience in environmental and waste issues. Um, and I'm Ann Erling. I'm the environmental lead in the um, Albany League of Women Voters board, uh, and I'm also deeply active in a number of climate groups in the capital region. And I want to say thanks to Ellen Sullivan, who's providing technical support behind the scenes for tonight's meeting. So, uh, as I mentioned, tonight's the second meeting uh, related to the Capital Region League's uh, four league position on waste. And our goal for the second meeting is to address how we can use this position as an impetus to bring about important changes in our region. Uh, we hope to set in motion a discussion about the specific role the League of Women Voters is well equipped to take in collaboration with a wide range of groups active in these issues in contributing to bringing about this vision and to talk about what we as individuals can do. Uh, we'll be providing a quick overview of a broad range of local issues in our four county region that are addressed by our new position. And then with the help of Tracy Frisch, we'll get a deep dive into some key issues we can focus on. And the ultimate goal is that we'll all leave energized and empowered to participate in league efforts to contribute to community efforts addressed by our four league position on waste. Let's see how I can get this thing out of my way here. we go. Um, uh, this is a quote, Margaret Mead quote, that is one I imagine all of you know, but I, I never tire of, of seeing it. Um, it's here for an important reason. We may not be experts in what we're doing. I know I can say that for myself, but uh, together as a collective, we're a genius. The only <laughs> way anything will change is if, if a group of thoughtful citizens like us bands together to move our communities forward. Uh, some of you may not be deeply familiar with the new four league position on waste, so we'll start with a brief introduction. Um, this position is a revision of an initial four league position on solid waste that our county leagues crafted 30 years ago in 1991. Each of our four counties included in our official program for this year, a plan to review and update this uh, position. And in November of last year, a group from our leagues began meeting and studying this. 
then on May 16th, with the position finalized and approved by all four boards, we held the first of these two meetings with membership and the public to go through the position in detail and begin each league's process uh, of gaining consensus on the position. Uh, these uh, consensus votes will be completed at our annual meetings later this month. Uh, an, a few salient features of this new position include that in this update, we expanded the concept of waste from the original 1991 position to include greenhouse gases. Um, we specified the goal of a circular economy and zero waste, though those I think were implied in the original uh, position. And we added attention to environmental justice. Um, and some of you may not be fully aware of the concept of environmental justice, so it's worth mentioning a bit more about that here. Environmental justice involves a recognition that some communities have borne a greater share of environmental harm from siting and funding and other decisions of the past. And then we need to end those practices, practices and actively work to fix the harm done. Uh, in New York State, we have a draft map of disadvantaged communities as a result of work being done to implement our landmark climate bill, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. This uh, here is the portion of the map that falls in our four county region. Uh, there are no environmental justice uh, zones uh, in Saratoga County, but they do exist in Albany, Rensselaer and Schenectady counties. Uh, and the Climate Justice Working Group, that's part of the Climate Action Council that was established as a result of this landmark climate <laughs> bill. Um, identified these communities with the use of 45 indicators that roughly follow degrees of poverty, percentages of minority residents, and degrees of pollution and health issues in our communities. Under New York State's climate law, at least 35% of the state's climate and clean energy investments need to benefit these communities. So we have this new position on waste, now what? As individuals, we can work on these issues, of course, with other groups that are already focused on them. And in just a few minutes, Nancy's going to take the mic and discuss some of these groups and issues they're addressing. We can also participate in public comment opportunities in our municipal and county legislative meetings and in response to other requests for input at any level of government. And we can reference this position when we do so. For example, I provided public comment to the Climate Action Council in a recent hearing, and I referenced the climate emergency resolution that the League of Women Voters of New York State passed in last summer's state convention. Uh, it's important to note that if we'd like to actually comment on behalf of the League, we need to get our county board's uh, approval, our county league board's approval, and a county league can only officially comment on local matters uh, unless they get state or national board approval to come and officially at those other next levels. Um, and we can also raise issues with our local county league of women voters or the state league or the national league. And we can suggest a formal league statement or call to action, or we can suggest that the league take part, take on a formal study or concur with a policy adopted elsewhere. These issues can be added to our count, a county's program for the year, which are a set of items that are put together in the spring and voted in on the, at the annual meeting. Uh, and as we do this, we can keep in mind specific strengths of the League of Women Voters that inform what role we can play uh, to add value to collaborative efforts with other groups working on these issues. And I'd say that the League has a unique depth of experience and skill in two key focus areas, in good governance and in helping citizens get informed and empowered to be engaged in what's happening in their, in their government and in their communities. So working with through our, our league's advocacy committees, we've developed experience working to influence elected leaders and legislation. We're a trusted source of information on issues of concern to the public, and we're committed to being nonpartisan. We offer regular educational programming and informational tools, and through them, we help the broader community understand issues. And we're informed by partnering with other local and national organizations. And we have the capacity to undertake formal league studies and carry out special projects. 
these are all things that we can do for this for the issue we're going to be discussing tonight. Um, and uh, a modest proposal <laughs> on the climate front, local climate activists aware of the vastness of the climate issue and the wide range of groups working on it locally created a central resource that we all use uh, to access fellow groups and see what might be done. It's really meant for newcomers to the issue. So all of, you know, everybody is invited to access this source. Um, and it's called the Climate Portal of the Capital Region. And you can find it at uh, climateportalcr.org. And I'm thinking we could use a similar central informational hub for an environmental issues addressed by our four league position on waste. I think that would be really valuable. Uh, and if we could crowdsource the process of gathering information among us all with a moderator to keep it all in the same format, we'd all have an easier time keeping track of what needs to be done without overly burdening any one of us. And it doesn't have to be a nice website you know, like this. It can just be a list. Uh, and another project that has started in our Albany League but needs additional volunteers is a project to monitor what our municipalities and counties are doing to respond to the carbon footprint reduction requirements of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. The goal is to be able to monitor the degree to which our communities are on track to make the emissions reductions goals we're required to make so that we can push our communities to be more ambitious when necessary. So if you're interested in participating in these projects or in any of the other efforts that we're gonna be discussing tonight, uh, let your league know and we can all co collaborate to hopefully make a difference in these things. So now I'm gonna uh, pass the mic over to Nancy. The presentation that I'm doing is issues and allies that we, of people we, and groups we can work with. Um, this part of the presentation will focus on a few local issues and allies um, that we can work with. We can't say enough about um, partnering with established and focused groups. There's no sense in reinventing the wheel with there's others groups who have completed some of the preliminary groundwork. In our region, we're uh, lucky to have many groups that are active in local environmental waste issues. Developing stronger collaborative relationships with them will help successfully address the issues that face us and will help the league. Um, I reached out to the different county league presidents and the environmental leads to ask them what were some of the concerns in their communities. And that's what um, I focused here. It's only a handful, it's about, well, I should say it's about nine. Um, there's many more in the area, but I thought we'd, I would just present these as examples of projects and uh, things that we can work on together. Um, so that was, so the first one I'll saw on this slide, you'll see I have four. I have the Sheridan Hollow Albany. It's a closed power plant and it's also what they call a brownfield opportunity area. Um, Sheridan Hollow is an area in Albany. It's uh, has it had a well-known former, a well-known polluter called the uh, Answers Plant, which burned trash to power state buildings. The plant was shut down in 1994 following a number of incidents in which it spewed black soot, soot that settled on cars, properties, and even the governor's mansion. Um, the state still runs the Sheridan Avenue steam plant, which powers the uh, Empire State Plaza. Uh, Sheridan Hollows is a what they call a brownfield opportunity area. Brownfields are um, neighborhoods or areas within a community negatively affected by real or perceived environmental conditions. Um, these properties are often underutilized because of contamination or the perceived, uh, you know, the perception thereof has impeded investment and redevelopment. So this is a project that there is a group out there called the Sheridan Hollow Albany, um, my notes here. Sheridan Hollow Albany, uh, Alliance for Renewable Energy. So again, that's something, and the one thing that the Brownfield Opportunity Areas allow is they are, they receive funding and they allow a lot of, they want the community input in what goes on into, in their community. So that was one of the uh, projects I heard about. The other one was the Lafarge Cement Plant. This one's located next to the Ravina Queen and Selkirk School, school and it's known for its dust and air pollution. Um, it's a cement plant and it has uh, known for coating the street with dust and also ground level air contamination of metals. Uh, for example, mercury, it has volatile organic compounds in their emissions and other contaminants 
released from their uh, cement kiln stack emissions. So again, there's a group, Clean Air Coalition, that is advocating for the closure of that plant. Um, the other one, this was a proposed project, the proposed sewage sludge biochar plant in Monroe. And uh, it's at the proposal stage, but there is a group, uh, Clean Air Action Network, that wants to make sure that things are done correctly and that they have enough background information on the sludge and what they would be um, treating. And then the last one on this slide is the uh, Norlite plant. Norlite plant is an aggregate plant uh, and it has uh, incinerator operation. There's a group out there called Lights Out Norlite. And um, Norlite's known to have, they, have hazard, they burn hazardous waste. Uh, again, they have aggregate piles that are, they say, taller than large office buildings. And the slightest amount of wind, that dust, um, ends up being throw, you know, spread through the community into people's homes and backyards and so on. So again, those are in, uh, examples of what I found for industrial pollution. I'm sure that there's uh, more air things going on in the community, but I just wanted to broach on those um, four. The next um, slide, this one we focus on um, protecting against toxins. Uh, so what I have here is um, concentrated animal feeding operations in Saratoga. And also a concern in Saratoga was the Saratoga Lake and Reservoir um, water quality. Um, so you might've heard of the term CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, which predominantly are known as uh, their dairy farms. And one of the, so there's about, I looked up, there's about 500 CAFOs in New York State. Saratoga has, from this map I saw, it was either three or four. And one of the big concerns with the location of the CAFOs, well, one is the size, and the other one is the location next to um, streams and rivers, so that you would have water runoff from the um, CAFOs. And then the other concern with the maintaining clean water in Saratoga Reservoir and in the lake, there's a group called Saratoga Lake Protection and Improvement District that you could get involved with. And again, the whole point is that there are groups already started that you know you could work with as an ally and get background um, material and you know see where you want to go with the project. Um, the, the bottom one is Rensselaer County, and. Uh, so Rensselaer, they're known with, for having the PFAS contamination in the uh, wells. And then they also have the Dunn C&D landfill in Rensselaer, which has a, it's a toxicity and noise um, issue around the traffic with um, near the school. The Dunn landfill was opened in 2015. It's a C&D landfill. Um, but again, I know the community is concerned with the dust, the diesel exhaust, being that it's near a, near a school. These, these two um, issues I have here, I, we call them restructuring for the future. So Schenectady Stockade um, has issues with flooding. Flooding in the stockade um, has been a reoccurring problem, which will only worsen with climate change. Um, flooding damages the structures, and what the community has said is that um, when there is flooding, it causes waste and the spread of toxins on their, on their property. Which both of these issues are addressed in our position. There's a group called the Stockade Association. Uh, they're an active working group and they are working with the city of Schenectady who has been awarded funding to work with the community on a solution for the flooding. Then um, the last one I have here is what we call the engagement in comprehensive, the comprehensive plan process. So New York State town law requires that towns develop comprehensive plans which are a vision for the future land use um, planning that guides decision-making at the local level. Each town either, this one seem, might seem odd, they either have a current comprehensive plan or they're in the process. Um, so for example, I know my town has one, but it's 16 years old, but they are in the process of, of updating that. Top, topics covered in the town's comprehensive plan include land use, transportation, housing, energy, infrastructure, Citizens can petition to serve on the comprehensive plan committees and or you can provide comments. Um, engaging the process, you could use the four league position you know, as a guide when making comments. Um, since 2017, there is a group called the Capital District Community Energy 
They have been organizing and advocating for establishing a region-wide community choice aggregation to allow municipalities in the capital district to purchase clean, affordable energy for the residents. Um, you can get more information at municipalsustainability.org. Uh, but again, that's each town, um, you know, having input on your town's planning for the use of land. Okay. And my last one is restructuring for the future. Um, discussing gas to electric trans uh, transition from gas natural gas to electric. Um, restructuring for the future with a goal of transitioning from gas to electric is another avenue for addressing inefficient um, homes and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we're, we're very accustomed to natural gas hookups in our homes. We don't think much about it until you might hear that there was an explosion. But the pipes distributing gas leak more than we know. And we now understand that these leaks contribute to climate crisis, poor health uh, for people, and there is a large waste of money. Uh, this here in the picture is a map of Massachusetts showing leaks in areas where leaks have been reported. A few organizations in Massachusetts are actively working on this issue. This is an example of a possible model where some baseline work on tracking gas leaks could also be used here in New York. Um, there's a group called Heat, uh, Heat home energy efficiency team, and they worked with National Grid to scientifically prove how to identify the largest gas leaks so that they could be fixed. Um, also, just last week, New York State Legislature passed the Utility Thermal Energy Network and Jobs Act, which this should make a difference as well. This act makes it possible for futures to move in the direction of building district geothermal systems that provide heating and air conditioning to buildings without the use of fossil fuels. Um, one of the other things here is that methane is one of the large leaks with the natural gases. Methane uh, is 86 times more potent in greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide in its first 20 years of, in the atmosphere. Um, so again, this is a, again something in the future that Massachusetts has worked on that maybe we could get information instead of reinventing the wheel, we could do a similar um, project here. Um, so that's the end of what I have for issues and allies. Again, you can ask questions um, at the end or put them in the chat. And at this point, I was going to introduce, I am going to introduce Tracy Frisch. She's our uh, guest here. Um, Tracy has organized and advocated on environmental issues for more than 30 years, both professionally and as a citizen volunteer. She earned a liberal arts degree from Sarah Lawrence College and served as a VISTA volunteer in the West Virginia coal fields. After becoming interested in organic agriculture, she went back to school and got an MS in entomology at Cornell. She moved to Albany in 1989 as a graduate fellow for the New York State Assembly where she wrote an award-winning report, Poisoning the Public for Profit, Pesticide Use and Abuse in the Empire State. In the 1990s and early 2000s, she worked as the executive director of two environmental organizations that she co-founded, the New York Coalition for Alternatives to Pesticides and the Regional Farm and Food Project. She also was involved in starting the Troy Waterfront Farmers Market. Go Tracy, I like that. <laughs> Sorry. In 2019, she started the Clean Air Act Network of Glens Falls and the Zero Waste Warren County, which has achieved the first reforms in the county solid waste management program in several decades. Zero Waste Warren County also offers occasional webinars on how to make zero waste oriented changes on subjects like reuse and repair, and eliminating single-use disposables in food service. Tracy first became an advocate for recycling in 1988 while a graduate student. She organized a campaign and within three months, Cornell University agreed to institutionalize um, recycling, which previously had been a haphazard affair relying on a junkyard and undergraduate volunteers. Tracy lives in rural Washington County in a passive solar home that she built with the help of friends and a few contractors. 
She grows much of her own food in her large organic gardens. She works part-time as an independent journalist. So at this point, I will turn it over to Tracy. Whoops, okay, so. Okay, does that work? So the title, thank you very much, Nancy and Anne. The title of my presentation is Moving Towards an End of Wasting, Putting Zero Waste in Practice Through Waste Reduction, Repair, Reuse, Recycling, Composting, et cetera. Um, about me, so my, my most active roles right now are with the Clean Air Action Network and Zero Waste. I'm also active um, with the Sierra Club where I'm primarily working on sewage sludge. Um, so um, we'll get right into it. This is the zero waste hierarchy. And so you'll notice um, the first three things have nothing to do with, are not involved with manipulating materials. They're, they're thinking, making decisions, management. Uh, well, reuse is, is um, materials, but they're not discards. Recycle and, recycling and compost, um, material recovery, and then we get to landfilling. Unacceptable is incineration and waste to energy, which some of my colleagues call waste of energy. And I'll explain further about that later. Okay, so this is the peer reviewed um, international definition of zero waste. The conservation of all resources by means of responsible production, consumption, reuse, and recovery of products, packaging, and materials without burning and with no discharges to land, water, or air that threaten the environment or human health. In other words, without pollution. Um, one of the many benefits of zero waste is it creates a lot more jobs than landfilling or incineration. And we produce each, each American produces approximately one ton of waste per year, a horrifying amount. Um, so my message tonight is, is simple. We can make huge strides towards zero waste and that's desirable and feasible. We can get to over 70% reduction in what goes to the landfill or an incinerator. Uh, zero waste makes sense for many on many different dimensions and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's experienced zero waste consultants who can create a practical cost-effective plan for implementing zero waste strategies at the municipal or county level. Um, and this is an example of uh, waste reduction, the reduction of the tonnage that goes to a landfill in one county in California, Alameda, which includes Berkeley. And you will notice that some towns and cities reduce their waste by as much by over 60%, as much as 73%. This is over a 24 year period, but a 50% waste reduction goal can be achieved in five years when there's a will and some resources. Um, zero waste, I wanna make the point that zero waste can be done in all kinds of settings. Uh, in 2003, Kamakatsu became the first municipality in Japan to make a zero waste declaration. They used to, they used to burn their, their garbage in the open. Um, and now they have reached more than 80% of their way towards zero waste by 2030. Um, I understand there's videos uh, of this town and they're very inspiring. So I, I wanna just mention that I'm gonna be providing all my references to, um, to Anne and Nancy so that you can access any of these documents and read further. Um, this is um, a zero waste plan, um, zero waste Montgomery County, and it was uh, intended to convince the county powers that be to uh, close their incinerator. It was produced last year. And by the end of the year, the county executive had made an announcement that they would be closing their incinerator. This is Montgomery County, Maryland. 
Um, and I will make this whole document, which is about 120 pages um, available. So you know what a zero waste plan looks like. So the first step in moving towards zero waste is, is setting a goal. If you don't have a goal, you can't really get to your destination. You can't make a roadmap because you don't know where you're going. So I've, I've, I've stressed this already, 50% reduction, 50% diversion of what's going to the landfill by quantity is a reasonable goal. And some, some cities and towns have reached that goal and then set a new goal. Maybe they'll get to 70% in the next, um, in the next um, five years. Um, okay, so here are some waste reduction strategies. The, the first one, which is um, which has been highly, um, um, mm, I'm losing my words, but um, Massachusetts has been promoting pay as you throw for many years, and I'll be showing you what kinds of impacts it has. When you have to pay for every bag of garbage you put out, people tend to put out less garbage and take participate uh, more in recycling. We can also ban single use and problematic materials. I, I suspect that the league has been involved with this in Albany County um, and New York State has, banned, has been banning um, some materials and items like the plastic shopping bag ban and the polystyrene uh, ban in food service and for packing peanuts. Um, we can also require reusables and this could start with a legislative campaign or with a social campaign. Um, it's amazing that in this day and age, uh, many school cafeterias are, are using um, disposable trays on a daily basis and even disposable utensils. Um, so this, um, this sets a really good example and it does cut waste. Um, there are also laws that have been put in place in some, in some cities that require reusable tableware in Eden food establishments. I understand that in Berkeley, California, when they passed that law, they also set up a fund to assist restaurants and cafes uh, in buying dishwashers. And then there's skip the stuff where, uh, and this could be by law, where restaurants and, and, and take, out, um, take out food establishments cannot give you can do not automatically give away uh, utensils, throw away utensils, condiments, napkins, except if the customer requests it. Um, so this is, this is what I was talking about with pay as you throw. And the, the, um, the blue, well, you'll see the higher, the higher part of the, the graph is before pay as you throw. And there's a huge, huge reduction reduction in how much waste people are putting out at the curb. Um, if you go to the left-hand bottom uh, quarter, you'll see Sanford, Maine, which is an interesting story. There was a man who didn't like pay as you throw. He got elected to the town board. Um, he um, led the charge to get rid of pay as you throw. The amount of waste that people were disposing of uh, went up immediately. And then several years later, um, maybe he left the town board or people wanted pay as you throw and then the waste um, generation was reduced again. So this really works. And I would encourage you to, to uh, start exploring how you can get this to happen in your town or city or county. Okay, reuse. Reuse enterprises uh, have multiple benefits and they're often um, organized as social enterprises, um, which have a dual mission, both environmental and providing living wage jobs, often providing decent entry-level employment for people on the margins, whether they're high school dropouts or, or coming out of crim the criminal justice system, or people they're in recovery, what have you. Um, many of these reuse enterprises, as you'll see in a moment, offer jobs uh, both job training and skills training, and they also uh, generate sales tax, uh, so have a direct um, benefit to the public sector. Uh, the flagship uh, for this type of 
reuse enterprise is called Urban Ore. Uh, it com comprises, it's a 40 year old um, for-profit business in Berkeley, California. I believe it's in Berkeley, three acres of recycled goods. Um, I made my pilgrimage there in um, 1988 after I finished grad school and took a three month trip around the country, around the continent. I remember seeing toilets. <laughs> I have, I have strange interests maybe. Um, so, uh, and they have many categories of reusables. It's like a giant thrift shop mall. One of the very interesting features is that the city of Berkeley pays urban ore by the ton for the materials it salvages at the transfer station. So uh, they have a truck and a crew, one or two people that go down to the transfer station on a daily basis and pull out things that are being taken to the transfer station to go to the, to go to the landfill. They pull out things that could be sold at Urban Ore and they're paid for, their, they're paid for that work. Um, the same amount that the city pays for landfilling those materials by weight. Um, so Dan Knapp, who's the founder, and he and his partner are selling the business um, to the employees and retiring. And he, he, told, he told me that they have three sources of goods, salvaging at the transfer station, pickup service for people who maybe don't have the, a vehicle or a truck to bring the materials there, and people who drop off things that they feel are too good to waste. Um, I am really impressed by the fact that they generate about $20,000 in sales tax per month. Uh, they were set last year to reach $3 million in, in gross sales. Um, they also have 30 full-time equivalent employees who started $18 an hour with full health benefits. Mm -hmm. And Dan said that a notable financial advantage for his type of business is there's no long-term pollution liability. It's very unusual in the waste sector. Um, another uh, reuse enterprise is Resource Vermont, which provides job training, reuse stores, repair services, and deconstruction. Um, and um, I love the stories about the people whose lives are changed by by their involvement with resource. They have youth build, they do deconstruction, uh, and they really, they train about 300, over 300 people per year. And most of those people get industry recognized certifications. Um, I know that there's a shortage of people in construction right now. There's a shortage of people who are able to uh, a, a repair appliances and computers and other things of that nature. And those are the types of things that they train people to do. Finger Lakes Reuse in Ithaca is also a reuse, a set of, also comprises a, a set of reuse enterprises. The founder, Diane Cohen, grew up in Del Mar and she's willing to offer free mentoring to people and groups that would like to start such a reuse enterprise in their community. She simply requires that they make a commitment to providing living wage, job, living wage jobs and environmental benefits. Uh, her group was started in 1995 when the Tompkins County Solid Waste Department presented uh, $40,000 in seed money for them to start up. Uh, this was a great investment. They now have 40 permanent employees, paid a living wage, multiple retail outlets, including a mega store in an old, in an old shopping mall. And they do some of the same kinds of things that reuse, um, that, re, that resource Vermont does. So there's a whole network of these kinds of enterprises and it's wonderful to see more develop. I think there's plenty of potential in the capital district. And these, these complement, they don't replace, but they complement other thrift, 
thrift stores and um, Salvation Army, which does not pay a living wage. Deconstruction is another type of, of, of reuse um, where we have many single family homes being demolished every year. And all this demolition waste goes to places like the Dunn Landfill in Rensselaer. Um, here's another enterprise in Baltimore called Second Chance. Second Chance for building materials, second chance for people who have been out of the labor market. Um, Resource Vermont also does deconstruction. Um, you can do deconstruction with many types of buildings, uh, although there is, there is some effort for buildings to be built so that they can be deconstructed, but any building that is not too, um, too derelict, too destroyed and rotted and moldy can be uh, deconstructed. Um, Empire Development, the state agency, used to have a program on reuse and deconstruction. This is an article that appeared in 2009, but um, about a dozen years ago, the agency reassigned all the employees working on it and dropped the program entirely. What a shame. Um, this, is, this is just um, to show you what other cities are doing. I think we know that Albany and Troy and probably Schenectady have hundreds of condemned structures. Um, in Pittsburgh, they were going, they were starting a deconstruction pilot project for city owned properties last fall. And they were also going to take, uh, going to uh, develop uh, standards for city funded demolitions. They see deconstruction as an integral part of their climate action plan. And another part of it is a zero waste goal for 2030. So, um, waste is really actually a very big part of climate um, emissions. Mm -hmm. When you waste products, you have to produce the products all over again, which, in, which involves a lot of energy use, a lot of mining, a lot of um, logging, a lot of other um, processes that contribute to climate change. Um, so we've already mentioned the Dunn landfill. Uh, some cities have ordinances that require deconstruction or recycling of building materials. And several of us, including Dan Rain uh, in Bethlehem and Renee Panetta uh, in Troy, two recycling coordinators have been talking about holding a summit or a workshop on deconstruction this fall. Um, so uh, the next part, whoops, excuse me. Oh, the, next, um, the next element of zero waste is recycling. Um, I'd like to, uh, I assert that our recycling system is broken. There's a low participation rate. Many people are confused about what can or cannot be recycled. High rates of contamination. Um, cause the quality of recyclable commodities to be, uh, uh, they, they compromise the, the quality of recyclable commodities when they don't meet industry standards, they are exported to the third world or trashed. Um, and someone asked me what contamination means. There's two types of contamination. If you put garbage or other things that are not recyclable by the recycling program in your recycling bin, that counts as contamination. Uh, or if you do not wash out your containers and they contain food residues or some shampoo or other things, that also is contamination. Um, another problem with our recycling system is New York has not been um, very good in oversight and enforcement. They can do a lot better. And finally, we can recycle many things that are not collected curbside, but there's not a lot of information or access in order to uh, do this kind of recycling. Um, recyclables have great value currently. Uh, markets have been high. Um, corrugated cardboard is worth more, it was worth more than $150 a ton 
bailed last year. It's currently priced well over $100 a ton. So why don't our communities reap the benefits of recycling? I'm gonna to try to tackle that question. Uh, but first I'm gonna give you some more evidence that there's demand for recyclables. Um, Maine Public Radio and then National Public Radio did, did a story about a recycled cardboard mill in Maine that was so desperate for cardboard that they set up sites for donations from local residents in nearby communities. Um, and this is something that I obtained. It's, you're not gonna be able to read it, but I can explain. Um, from a broker last year, um, which is the market price for different plastics. And at that point, the market price ranged from $400 to $2,000 per ton. Plastic doesn't weigh very much, but nonetheless, this is substantial. And if you, you can see this, uh, the current price is in pennies. So pennies per pound. So when it's over 100 pennies per pound, that translates to $2,000 per ton. And this is um, mostly the values are with um, recyclables that are bailed by resin, resin numbers. So number ones or number twos or number fives, et cetera. Um, so uh, shockingly, um, many cities and towns are paying two to three times more to get rid of their residents' recyclables than they pay to get rid of the garbage they collect. How could this be? Um, well, it's, it's because the cost for processing that is sorting and bailing single stream recycling is approximately $150 a ton. Um, so what happened was that big waste companies like waste management sold the idea of single stream recycling to municipalities and to residential customers for its convenience and the lower collection cost. Um, and I don't know exactly when this was, I'm sorry, but this is, this is um, probably a dozen years ago. And Big Waste, which owned the single stream sorting facilities, thus gained a monopoly. Um, so I wanna compare dual stream, which is what most communities used to do with single stream. Dual stream is when you have two bins, one for paper and cardboard, and one for cans and bottles and jars. And you put your recyclables out uh, in these two bins, and you either do, or you alternate one week it's, it's containers and the next week it's fiber, paper and cardboard. Uh, in those systems, studies show there's very low contamination. It's a little more costly to connect because you have to move two bins or take two trips, but it's much less expensive to sort. And because the, the recyclables are far less contaminated, their value is higher. Also, you don't have um, cardboard that's embedded with glass and, and things like that, which is a consistent problem with, with single stream when all these recyclables are packed in a truck. Um, with single stream, which is also called no sort, contamination rates are commonly higher than 20%. It's much more expensive to sort, the value of recyclables are lower. And one of the reasons it's so contaminated is because um, single stream. So people take it that seriously as single stream and they put in a lot of things that are not recyclable. One person likens single stream to people having another garbage can. It is actually a very serious problem. So I wanna make the case that municipalities have choices. I don't think many municipalities have gone back and evaluated, assessed the way they're, they're um, carrying out recycling programs, but, they, but it's possible for municipalities to choose, single, to choose dual stream. It's also possible for, for municipalities to build and operate their own sorting facility, which is known as a MRF, a material recovery facility. Um, and there are new, new systems being marketed 
uh, that are sized appropriate to a city's or um, a, a rural county's needs. Um, so this is increasingly possible to do. Uh, municipalities also have a choice. They can contract with a MRF owned by a big waste corporation like the one in Albany owned by Waste Connections. I'll show you some photos. Or they could um, contract with a community-based nonprofit. There is none in the area, but it is. it would be possible for a community-based profit to be supported and to uh, gain investors and to uh, set up as a social enterprise. And finally, a really unusual idea, another system is called curb sort. Center County, Pennsylvania, where State College is, has a very uh, well-respected recycling program, and that's what they use. I'm gonna show you a few slides of specialty trucks for collecting um, recyclables and sorting at the curb. Uh, this is a company in Ireland called um, Roma Quip. And you can see there's different compartments for different materials. And um, people put out their recyclables in already sorted and then the employees put them in the correct compartments. Mm -hmm. And this one is all electric. Um, I have a link to a video. I won't show that now, but I will send that along. It's a four minute video and it's really cool. Okay, so then there's another approach. I talked about these community-based um, nonprofits. There's a uh, three-year-old association of mission-based recycler, recyclers called Amber. And um, they operate, not surprisingly, in Ann Arbor, Berkeley, Boulder, and Minneapolis. In Minneapolis, they have the contract to do all the curbside recycling and to run their own MRF. I like, I like their spirit and I think we can learn from them, which is why I'm mentioning them, what we should expect from recycling. Um, and what they say is that MRFs must protect workers with fair labor practices, strive for highest and best use of materials. That's like, so you don't wanna downcycle, you wanna, you wanna recycle into similar materials if possible. And you want to, and, and in, finally employ ethical marketing standards to ensure materials are actually being recycled, which is the big question that many people have about recycling. Okay, this is the tipping full floor where the trucks come in and dump the recycling at Sierra Processing near the Port of Albany. Um, this MRF was built and operated by County Waste in 2011 when County Waste uh, was sold to Waste Connections, one of the top four waste services corporations in North America. Waste Connections took over this facility. Um, this is a, these are the line workers, which I will add are temporary workers employed by a temp agency that is located on the premises of Sierra Processing. This is a common practice in the MRFs in the recycling industry nationwide. The people doing the dirtiest, most dangerous, loudest, um, hardest work in these facilities are temp workers. Um, there was a, a man was killed at the Sierra Processing um, several years ago. He was trying to pull a piece of plastic off the line and was sucked in and was dead by the time um, the emergency services came. So uh, very sad story. And you, you can, I'm the second person from the left on in the tour group on the right. That was a tour from Honest Weight Food Co-op. Um, this, if you, you look at the bale closest to the foreground, um, that is contaminated cardboard. A uh, recent tour that someone in our zero waste group organized, the guide from Sierra Processing told the group that they often send their corrugated cardboard to Vietnam in a shipping container 
and that sometimes it gets wet before it arrives and is moldy and is discarded because it's not recyclable. Um, there's some bales. I just wanna show you a contrast. Our uh, zero waste Warren County group took a field trip to Lake Placid to the North Elba transfer station where the public brings their own sorted recyclables uh, to see how uh, an effective system worked. The contamination rates are very low. There's good signage. There's an easy to use system. And uh, there were people steadily coming in as we, on, it was a Wednesday, I believe, when we, when we were up there. They are able to sell all the recyclables. They bail, I'll show you a baler in a second, at market rates, even though they're in the middle of nowhere. Um, whoops, why is it not advancing? Um, this is an industrial baler. They have four or five of these industrial balers. Um, residents put their office paper and junk mail in on the top of the baler, and then the employees run the baler when it's, um, when it's um, full. Uh, they have collection in the public room. This is in the employee, uh, in the room that's off limits to the public. They, they take the bins, small bins, and they look at them to make sure they're not contaminated. Then they move them to this bay uh, where it gradually fills up. They'll run it over with a um, piece of equipment to compress it, and then they'll bale it. Um, their corrugated cardboard includes box board, and there's no contamination. They're, they're very careful to keep out contaminants. Um, they accept redeemable bottles uh, uh, and cans and you know, glass and, and aluminum and plastic, and then they redeem them and they give the redemption money to a different local nonprofit every month, which I'm sure makes them a popular place. Um, I wanna just mention that the bottle bill uh, provides the cleanest and best sorted recycling in the state. So it's very important to pass the expanded bottle bill, which is also called the better bottle bill. It would raise um, the redemption rate from a nickel to a dime. After 40 years, we, we really need to do that. It would expand um, the bottle bill to cover things like wine bottles and uh, iced tea and other beverages. So I wanna, wanna mention a few reasons that I came up with that people don't recycle. I think some people think recycling isn't for them, that they're not the right people to recycle. I think it's more common than we would imagine that people don't understand what recycling means. A um, lot mass confusion about what can go into recycling, lack of confidence that stuff actually gets recycled and the urban legend, which is actually true in some cases, that waste collectors are dumping recycling in with the garbage at the curbside. There are, um, the information officer in Warren County told me that they changed waste haulers multiple times and one of them had the audacity to tell him or his wife that they were taking the, the mixed waste, the recycling and the garbage to the incinerator where it was sorted. Um, it's an insane what people will try to, will say to pull the wool over our eyes. Um, people might think it's too much trouble and without pay as you throw, why bother? Because you could put out as much garbage as you want at no extra cost. Um, Certain recyclables are not being recycled in single stream recycling. One of those thing, one of those uh, commodities is glass. Glass goes as landfill cover because it's too broken and contaminated with plastics. Even though glass furnaces want recycled glass, its use cuts fossil fuel um, and thus greenhouse gases and it saves the glass companies a lot of money. Uh, you can recycle clean glass, clear only at outside of um, Honest Weight Food Co-op, thanks to a pilot project um, started by Zero Waste Capital District. 
and it is collected by um, Tomra, which then sends it to one of its plants where it's um, clean to make sure there's no metals and then sent to, sold to a glass furnace. Also only plastics one and two and sometimes five are readily recycled. I checked with Twin Bridges, which is another MRF and they do take number fives. I did not hear back from Sierra Processing. Um, wish cycling is counterproductive. And so don't put in things that you are not sure they recycle because it will only require more sorting and more waste going to the landfill. Um, other types of plastic besides one, twos, and sometimes fives should just be put in the trash. They do not get recycled commonly. I like this poster. This was an ad that Urban Ore, that reuse establishment in Berkeley, California, they have a series of ads that they put in local newspapers, and this was one of them. There's been various um, initiatives to improve recycling. Uh, one of them it was in California. They passed a law last year, signed into law. They passed a bill, rather. Um, that bans the use of the chasing our arrows recycling symbol on anything that is not commonly recycled in California recycling programs. This would really help us out. There were no standards for this. This was actually a ploy of the plastics industry to gain acceptance uh, several decades ago for, for the expansion of plastics in everything. Um, and these are priority um, toxic substances and materials that contaminate recycling. This was a list compiled by Judith Enk of Beyond Plastics. Um, when, we have, when we have toxic substances in packaging or in other recyclables, uh, they get dispersed into everything that we recycle or they can't be recycled. So it's very problematic. You do not want halogenated flame retardants in recycled plastics or PFAS or lead or cadmium. Um, so um, this is the type of legislation, the type of ban that would be really great to get passed in New York. Moving on to organics. The biggest impact we can have on climate in terms of, in, in terms of waste management would be getting organics out of the landfills. That includes food waste, yard waste, and paper and cardboard. When they break down in the wet anaerobic environments, like landfills, they release methane, which as we've heard is far more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. There's two things we need to do to solve this problem. One is we need to make sure that everyone diverts food waste from the garbage. And that would include providing mandatory curbside collection, which is not happening anywhere in the capital district as of now. And we need well-run composting facilities that recycle organics into healthy, a healthy soil amendment. We would recommend, that is um, Zero Waste Warren County would recommend that compost facilities be publicly owned and operated like the town of Bethlehem uh, composting facility that we visited last Friday, or they would be farm-based, community-based, or private locally owned. We recommend avoiding big waste ownership for greater accountability. We do not want food waste composting to be done in a way without regard to contamination. Because I just as we don't want those high priority toxics in our recycling. Um, I wrote this article in 2011 about the first, um, the first residential food waste collection service um, in two towns on the North shore of Massachusetts. I will send you this article. And what I especially like about this is um, that the League of Women Voters uh, got these two towns involved with waste by doing a study of pay as you throw. And that got people engaged. They did that study in 2004 
and that indirectly led to the residential food waste collection rollout. And for this, they partnered with a local composter. Um, so California, once again, is leading the way. Um, they passed the law, the state passed the law last year, which calls for a 75% reduction in organic waste disposal by 2025 to reduce methane emissions. In future years, individuals and businesses that don't adequately separate their food and green waste could face fines of up to $500 a day and cities that don't comply could face fines of up to $10,000 per day per violation. Think about that in terms of our own state and, and lack of rapid movement. They've been having, they've, they've in big cities and some many towns on the West Coast, they've had um, universal food waste um, diversion, collect, curbside collection um, for, a while. Um, I want to bring to your attention the fact that compostable, um, biodegradable tableware and packaging is often not welcomed by composters. The main composting uh, enterprises in Oregon put out this several years ago. They put out an open letter saying, we do not want this, these materials. They do not compost uh, fast enough. Um, and another problem, and I'll send you this as well, another problem is that a composting operation cannot tell the difference between compostable utensils or compostable um, packaging and non-compostable. Um, and so really keep that front and center in your mind when you think about um, what you'd like to suggest to uh, businesses, the municipality, school system, et cetera. Um, there was a um, headline in a, um, in a um, Bay Area newspaper calling attention to a troubling trend with food waste, waste recycling. That is more, more food waste was ending up in the garbage in 2014 than 2013. Um, you have to monitor when you're rolling out any of these programs, you have to pay attention to them for years and an ongoing basis um, and, and try and figure out what's going wrong. There's a group called Stop Waste in Alameda County that quantified the trend and um, yeah, important lesson for our own recycling and composting programs. Um, so I wanna to move to what is unacceptable in zero waste. Burning, incineration, or turning waste into fuel for industrial plants, discharges to land, water, and air, or air that threaten the environment or human health, and trying to process waste without source separation due to contamination and inefficiency. Um, trash incinerators are more polluting than coal-fired power plants, according to DEC data, emissions per megawatt hour. Megawatt hour. And um, in most, every, um, every city or county that I've had anything to do with on incineration, uh, the incinerator was the worst air polluter. This is true in Warren in Washington County where there's an incinerator in Hudson Falls. It's true in Westchester County and it's true in Baltimore City, for example. Um, incinerators are not, I'm talking about incinerators even though I know there are no incinerators in the Capital District because this is an important, an important state issue. New York State has 10 trash incinerators which is the most of any state other than Florida. Massachusetts recently closed or announced the closure of two trash incinerators in Pittsfield and Springfield. The Hartford incinerator in Connecticut has closed or is closing, but we have not closed any of our 10 incinerators and some of them are well over 30 years old. The, West, the incinerator in Peekskill in Westchester County 
has a contract. It's owned by the county. It has a contract with the incinerator operator until 2029. By then it will be 40 plus, like around 45 years old, way too long to uh, continue to operate. But incinerators are not an, uh, an alternative to landfills because they produce toxic ash that has to go to a landfill. And this, this, there's no beneficial use for toxic ash. There's only one incinerator built in the US since 1997, in part due to organized opposition. Uh, there's other sorts of burning that are, uh, there's um, growing momentum for them, such as burning plastics and other wastes in cement kilns. There's two cement kilns in the state, Lafarge and Queemans and Lehigh in Glens Falls. This is where um, cement companies take limestone and heat it to 3000 degrees and, and then grind up the resulting material, turning it into cement. So we don't wanna be burning plastics or tires or other horrible things like that. Um, so I just wanna make a plea. There's, there's always companies that come along and say, we have this magical process. We can take your mixed waste. We can remove the recyclables. We can, we can do all kinds of, of, of wild things with that. And that, those are greenwashing claims. The only way to really effectively recycle is for the generator, be it the resident, the business, the consumer, um, to um, do the source separation. To put the recyclables in one place, the food waste in another place, the garbage uh, else in another bin. Um, in Fort Edward, there's been a proposal uh, that's, there's been a project, um, uh, there's been a company considering Fort Edward, the site of the dewatering plant, um, which was used for dewatering the PCB contaminated sludge. Um, this company is called Hughes Energy. They have a project uh, they're trying to put through in Delaware County and that has spawned a group called Don't Trash the Catskills. Um, with another member of our Zero Waste Group, we wrote a guest essay in the Post Star. Uh, Hughes Energy would have us believe that pressure, cooker, pressure, pressure cooking 465 tons of garbage a day is a safe, clean, odor-free, and rational way to deal with municipal solid waste. This garbage would be steamed under high pressure in a huge industrial autoclave, 60 feet long and 10 feet high at the former dewatering plant site on the Champlain Canal. And they call themselves a green business and they claim that this is composting, although when you contact them, they say, oh yeah, we're changing that. And you go back to their website and, it's, and their social media and they still call it composting. Um, I won't go any further with what their, what their um, scheme is, but I will send you, I will make available some um, background materials. Judith Thank came to a meeting that I was invited to with the CEO because I was poking around about this company and uh, she put out this statement. Um, it won't work and it's the last thing the local industrial development agency should be financing. Um, so the latest news is that Hughes Energy is now exploring the town of Half Moon in Saratoga County as a place to go. So I want to alert the Saratoga, their Saratoga League members will be providing some information. Um, another, another false solution type uh, company type proposal was BioHighTech which wanted to turn mixed solid waste, including tires and plastic into fuel for cement plants. There was massive opposition and um, DEC has rejected the proposal. The last um, project I wanna to call to your attention is, um, is, the bio, is the sewage sludge biochar project near the Hudson River in the Moreau Industrial Park. This is in the, Project, this is in the proposal stage. 
there was a hearing before the Moreau Planning Board last month. There was excellent testimony. The Planning Board is again meeting tonight. Um, it would be the first such plant in the state. I uh, met with the lead author on a 2022 peer reviewed study of what happens to PFAS in sewage sludge when it's being made into biochar at a commercial plant. Um, they could not determine what happened to the PFAS. PFAS is a fluorinated a, a class of fluorinated compounds. There's as many as 5,000 by some estimates, 9,000 by other estimates. The air test for PFAS only can test for 11 compounds. Another way to quantify um, PFAS is to test total fluorine. They were not able to do that in their study. Um, there are other studies as well that found uh, that could not quantify what happened to the PFAS. I'll get to sewage sludge and why there's PFAS in sewage sludge in a little bit. Sewage sludge also contains high levels of heavy metals in some cases, and the company has not mentioned anything about heavy metals in their application materials. Um, Glens Falls, for example, has high levels of cadmium, chromium, lead, and mercury in some of its, its tests. Currently, uh, EPA requires only that wastewater treatment plants test periodically for heavy metals and E. coli. They don't have to test for things like PFAS. The plant in, in Moreau would operate 24-7. Um, the residents, it, the industrial park only has one facility and uh, it's surrounded by residents and it's near the Hudson River. People are very concerned about the stench of sewage sludge. There would be um, up to 50 truckloads a day um, when the plant would be totally built out. And there's also the noise from wood chipping. Ironically, the people of Moreau outside of South Glens Falls are on septic. Most um, some existing sewage sludge biochar plants are at the site of a wastewater treatment plant, so there's no sewage sludge trucking that has to happen. Um, I want to talk about contamination issues in organics. Um, we don't want to create a disaster where all our soils are contaminated because they had contaminated um, compost applied. Microplastics is it can be a big one in compost from food waste because of these large expensive machines called depacking machines that extrude packaged foods from the packaging without requiring any um, hand labor. This is a problem that has been identified um, by composters and scientists in Vermont. And microplastics, as some of you may know, have been found deep in human lungs. They've been found in the human placenta. They've been found in baby feces. Uh, there's, this is a serious problem and it's also a problem for soil health. PFAS forever chemicals um, can come especially from food package, packaging that contains PFAS. Um, New York State has banned such food packaging but the ban only goes into effect next January, 2023. And I am perplexed about how the state is going to enforce that. And finally, in some cases, highly persistent herbicides used in grain production uh, have, uh, that can pass through the, the livestock digestive system have contaminated compost and that compost has ended up being uh, phytotoxic, uh, toxic to plants. And this could be um, addressed by composters planting beans and different batches of compost to make sure that there's no phytotoxicity. Okay, I mentioned PFAS in sewage sludge, which might not be widely known. The state of Maine has been ground zero for this problem only because of a set of um, 
ac accidental circumstances, which I won't go into. In 2017, one farmer, dairy farmer, whose farm is pictured, learned that his well water was contaminated. He told his um, the milk company he sold his milk for. They had him test. They had tests done of his milk, very high in PFAS, um, which is a highly persistent um, uh, group of chemicals that can cause cancer, hormone disrupt our hormone systems, depress the immune system, and bioaccumulate up the food chain. This this farmer um, applied sewage sludge to his fields as fertilizer under a state program decades ago. The state assured all the farmers who did this that it was safe and that it was practically their civic duty to help manage sewage sludge from wastewater treatment plants. In- um, Tracy? Yes. This is, this is Nancy. I just wanted to let everyone know it, it is 8.30 and we were gonna stay and continue. Um, and I'm, I'm very close to the end. Okay, I just want to let everyone know we are recording it if they do have to leave, but we are going to continue. Okay, keep, okay, keep going. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. So half the sewage sludge in the U.S. is spread on farmland. And it's uh, every, every sample of sewage sludge that has been tested is found to be contaminated with some PFAS chemicals because of PFAS um, in consumer products, in uh, stain and water resistant apparel um, and, a num and even floor cleaners. Um, so I mentioned the ban on the land application of sewage sludge. At least I think I mentioned it. it's the first ban of any state. Um, and it is heart wrenching what people are going through in Maine. Um, and the same uh, situation is probably in effect in New York, but the testing has only just begun this year. Another source of PFAS in wastewater treatment plants is landfill leachate. Landfills have a lot of PFAS in, in garbage. There's a lot of PFAS in various products that we throw away. Uh, and landfill leachate is high in PFAS. Um, but there's no regulation that prevents wastewater treatment plants from taking this leachate to wastewater treatment plants, even though Wastewater treatment plants do not have the capacity to detoxify or filter out PFAS or any other chemicals. Um, I, I learned in a Zoom meeting recently that Seneca Meadows, the biggest um, landfill in the state in the Finger Lakes, um, one third of their landfill leachate is treated with reverse osmosis, a good system, but two thirds is sent is trucked to wastewater treatment plants, to five wastewater treatment plants, just thus contaminated, contaminating the sewage sludge from these um, plants at very high levels. I did a freedom of information request and received this data. Um, I will not go into it now, but I will just, we will probably be doing a press conference through the Sierra Club Farm and Food Committee and uh, several other groups in the state that are active on PFAS. Um, I will just tell you that these levels are higher than the levels that Maine several years ago put into effect as their standards for PFAS and sewage sludge. They determined, uh, it was determined after several years that, that their standards were not adequate and um, there was, uh, a lot of advocacy to get the ban, um, led by groups like the Maine Farmland, uh, I'm forgetting the name of it, um, Maine Farmland Trust, I believe, the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners, and Defend Our Health, which is an environmental health group. Okay, so I think that gives you, um, that gives you information to understand that not every product or material should be recycled. Um, dispersing poisons in the environment or into new products negates any benefits of recycling. And sometimes we don't get a second chance. So we need to be vigilant, we need to do our homework and we need to advocate vigorously on these kinds of issues. 
Um, so I was asked what the next steps were because there's an awful lot of information in my, uh, in my presentation. So here are some suggestions. Pers persuade your town, city, or county to pass a zero waste resolution. Include the goal of 50% reduction in waste going for disposal within five years. Get your city or county to put out a request for proposals for a certified zero waste consultant to develop a zero waste plan. I will provide several model resolutions and a successful request for proposals. And I can put you in touch with a nonprofit advisor who has assisted community groups in crafting impactful language. You do not want a regular engineer to do a zero waste plan. They are not trained in zero waste. They are thinking about solid waste disposal. Additional next steps, collaborate with Zero Waste Capital District and other NGOs and maybe some governmental bodies to increase food waste com composting capacity and push for curbside collection in the capital district or in your town or county. Um, and also initiate a project with local partners to fix the broken recycling system and take back control of recycling. And I, I work with some national advisors who would be thrilled to work with you on such a project. And where is my cursor? Um, and finally, I'm happy to share resources and referrals and would be pleased to hear from you. I love discussing policy ideas and um, yeah, I really hope to, to be in touch with some of you in the future. So thank you very much. I will stop screen sharing. Nancy, you're muted. I think you're muted. Now you're muted again. Okay, how's that? Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Hopefully, I'll have a. I'll be okay with this, right? So let me pull up my presentation. Yeah, we just have one more. Um, okay. Let me do my slideshow. If, and if I can't get it, I'm just going to go on with the discussion. How about now? Working? Wrap up? Where do we go from here? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, we want to wrap up and I know we're running over. We have plenty of time for questions uh, and I'll go through the chat, but um, we as a league can work to get our legislative bodies to issue resolutions and pass ordinances to implement the vision of the four league position. The recording will be available off our league website with related information that we're going to receive from Tracy. We can develop additional um, educational programming to help our communities better understand all these issues. We can contribute to efforts to build helpful informational resources. Um, and we can also individually volunteer to contribute to these efforts in our communities. So at this point, um, we're gonna go into questions. If you want, you can also, I, I'll go through the chat, but you can also um, raise your hand so I am going to stop sharing and everybody should have the view. So I don't know, if, uh, do you want me to just start with the chat room or does anyone have anything in particular? No, we're gonna go to chat. Okay, so Tracy, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so one of the questions that, um, came up, let me go back here to, uh, can you recommend ways to support low and moderate income people when starting pay as you throw programs? Yes, there could be, um, there could be, um, a, you know, a, a base uh, amount of bags given out for free for people who qualify. They could be people who are in it. It could be people on any kind of government assistance, but we're not talking about, it's not gonna be very costly if people recycle. Um, for example, 
I believe bags in Saratoga, at least several years back, were $4 a garbage bag. They're regulation garbage bags. If you can't use another type of garbage bag and put your, your garbage out curbside, as I understood their program. So $4, you know, for a week's garbage is not a huge amount. So it's not like we're charging $50 a week or anything. So, um, but, but yes, there are, there are programs that, that is built in to many programs. And they, in Massachusetts, um, pay as you throw has been um, instituted in communities like Springfield, which is not, has a lot of low income people. So there's, there's a wealth of information about how it was implemented and, and, and such. Okay. Some of these are comments. I'll read them anyways. And if you sure, want to sure. Okay. So um, <clears throat> Pat wrote, reuse programs seem like a natural in this student rental dense region. Um, that was one. Let's see. Urban ore takes all sorts of building materials like doors, windows, and other fixtures, including toilets, sinks, and tubs. That was one. So maybe I missed it, but is it is it a matter of just somebody contacting Urban Ore? No, up? Urban Ore is, is a local um, business in California. Oh, okay. we, we did two webinars last year on um, reuse and repair as a, neck, as a form of economic development and another one on how to start um, an enterprise, a reuse enterprise. Those webinar recordings are available online. I can make those available. And you know, I think there's, it's high time that, that people in the capital region come together and set up something. It doesn't have to be the league and um, giving people more exposure to these options you know, there, there, there is Restore um, from mm -hmm. Habitat for Humanity, but a lot of the materials they get are from chains, like, like Home Depot donations, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, surplus building materials that are on a, a construction site or, um, dem, you know, deconstruction materials. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're very good programs, but there's tremendous potential to expand. And there's room for a multitude of, of such enterprises in an area. Uh, but I was at a webinar with someone, I think that was in Gainesville, Florida, and where they have a resource recovery park where they have several different enterprises for different sorts of reuse and recyclables at co-located. So it's very convenient for people. And what the, the presenter who runs a reuse business said is we need reuse facilities that are as big as big box stores because that's the amount of materials that people are buying and a lot of them are getting rid of them one of the biggest um, sources of waste in in by sector is is fashion clothing fast fashion where it's cheap people wear it a few times it's not now necessarily well made so it's not very well suited for reuse but moving away from that into more durable kinds of clothing, furniture, et cetera, um, does, does encourage reuse. Yes. Um, the Schenectady Stockade, they, they had talked about a lot of old buildings needed to be knocked down. So for the deconstruction, I don't know if you're familiar, is asbestos a big concern or is it, are they able to separate or? Asbestos is a concern and needs to be dealt with as, even when you demolish a building, you need to test for asbestos. And you, if you have asbestos, you need to have a certified contractor. So that would be the case for anything. Okay. You know, even if you're doing demolition, you have to deal with it. In my rural town of Argyle, there's an old house on my property. And if I wanted to demolish it, I have to test for asbestos. So this is universal. Okay. Um, you mentioned that some things that aren't collected curbside can be recycled. Can you speak to recycling of plastic wrap? What sorts of plastic can be recycled that way and where do people bring it? Well, this is, this is the problem. If we had a good, if we had a comprehensive recycling program, then these kinds of things would be dealt with. I, I need to just say that recycling is a, uh, it has to be socialized. It's not like one person can't do a terrific job and leave the other people behind because mm -hmm. we need, we need the, 
the means of recycling to be uh, public, to be accessible to all if we're gonna really recycle. Um, plastic film, I've, I've not been able to figure out plastic film. There are companies that recycle plastic film and plastic film and bags are collected in some in supermarkets, no longer at the co-op. The co-op uh, doesn't never gave out those bags, so it didn't have to recycle, collect them for recycling. But it, you know, I would say contact your the recycling community coordinator in your city if you live in a city and ask them if you can help them set up a program, or reach out to Zero Waste and ask them if there are other people who might want to work on it. Okay, um, questions about contamination. Does the plastic window of an envelope contaminate the paper of the envelope? No, no. Recycling mills are able to take out that, that kind of material. Um, also the tape on cardboard, they can take, you know, their process of cooking the, you know, making pulp out of the, the, re, the paper or the cardboard, they're able to separate that out. Colors on cardboard affect the ability to recycle. No. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, is it likely that additional plastic numbers will be start will start getting recycled? In which case? No. No. Yeah. It's 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 kind of a a, a chemist chemical engineering challenge. I I just will mention that plastics are polymers. They're long chains. And each time you recycle them, the chain gets shorter. And so the quality degrades, which is why, um, why certain plastics will be made into say fleece or, or stuffing in an acrylic um, jacket you know, in, in the future. And then that material can't be recycled. And also there are microplastics from that that um, contaminate our personal space and our environment. So recycling is not a panacea for everything. Glass is one of the, glass and aluminum are amongst the most recyclable materials. And so I think advocating for real glass recycling, not only going to Honest Weight Food Co-op and putting it in a bin there is, is important. Um, you know, we should be the things that are very recyclable. What do you not, think of, oh, sorry. And not struggling so much over plastics, which we just need to reduce in our lives. Well, um, is it okay to use a disposal for food? What do you think of food waste going down a disposal? Yeah, I, I answered that in the chat that oh, yeah. food waste should not go into the disposal because it goes into the sewer system, is contaminated with sewage sludge, okay. and it also increases the biological oxygen demand which is not good for our water bodies. Wow. And then you answered, uh, there was a question, can you do a zero waste policy for a municipality that does not do municipal collection, but instead has commercial haulers? You and can. You said, yes. You can, and there are, there are strategies for, for doing that. One of them might be franchising so that um, you put out for bid for commercial haulers, and then you might and you have specifications that are zero waste oriented. Um, so they'd have to like measure how much recycling they're doing and things like that and you know, make it user friendly and maybe pay as you throw. And, uh, and then you would award the, the, the franchise to different haulers, maybe for different parts of the municipality. But that's one way that, that communities have done that. Another question, how can we stop PFAS? Uh, how can we stop the source of PFAS? Um, we, we, the problem is that EPA is not treating PFAS as a class of chemicals. They, you can't regulate 9,000, 5,000 or 9,000 chemicals one at a time. Um, they've been extremely slow to do any regulation. Um, and so we can advocate for that kind of, um, that kind of ban at the state level. We can advocate at the federal level. Um, but, you know, this, unfortunately, the source is going to be with us for a long time because people are going to still have their water repellent, stain repellent 
uh, furnishings and clothing and stuff. And, but we need to get it out. There's, there's work being done to get PFAS out of consumer products, out of cosmetics. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. Hmm. Also, I understand from a, an impacted um, resident of who's at falls, who has many health problems, which she attributes to having been drinking contaminated water for her whole life. She has various autoimmune problems. Um, she told me she's had a couple of like, um, I don't know, like hip replacement or other, I'm not sure what they were, appliances, medical appliances. They have PFAS in them. It's yeah. just horrifying. And we got a few good presentation, very informative. And our last question is, um, <clears throat> Are there any New York State municipal models that encompass some or all of the best recycling principles in operation? Okay, there are several. Um, Ulster County has a dual stream, publicly owned um, uh, MRF uh, materials recovery facility. Um, Westchester County does as well. I think it might be easier to find out about the one in Ulster County. One of the problems in New York, when we started our zero waste group, I contacted DEC to say, could you, could you point me to some of the model programs? DEC basically said, no, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, we are not gonna get any progress unless we do have some case studies of best practices of, of good community programs. And we, we highlight those. So. I think actually advocating for, for that kind of change at DEC or through some state, um, maybe through the governor's office, we need, we need change really quickly. And um, we don't have the tools that we need. I'll tell you a tiny, a little story. In Warren County, all the towns are required to have transfer stations, including towns of 400 people. Um, so there are 12 transfer stations owned by towns, they have been paying to get rid of cardboard, close to $150 a ton, even though cardboard has, I think it was $120 a ton, even though the value of cardboard was $150. I went to the state, I talked to a section chief on a number of occasions and I said, could you provide a list of recycling markets? Can you help us? They said, no, we don't do that. Okay, we have a problem. They connected me with a new institute at, at SUNY ESF and um, in Syracuse. We met with them week after week. We never really got anywhere with them. We just said, okay, when you have materials that can help us, let us know because we can't continue to waste our time. Um, yeah, we, we, we are in sort of a dire situation. Um, some proposals would require legislation, some would not. Some can be done uniquely at the local level. Um, I would be very interested in putting together kind of a working group. From, there's other zero waste groups, there's other initiatives around the state. But I think at this point, I'm gonna be starting with PFAS and landfill leachate, sewage sludge, because there's a kind of coalition forming uh, largely through the Sierra Club, in fact, local activists. Um, but um, yeah, I think slowly we can, um, you know, we need to build a coalition and there's the, an emerging coalition to work on getting New York State through the legislature to shut down all the remaining trash incinerators, mm. which are worse for climate change than greenhouses, um, despite what you hear. Especially if we do food waste composting, we can be done with that. So I thank everyone and I look forward as yeah, I said. We have one more question. Oh, just, okay, I'm sorry gonna... about that. That's okay. I know that you're putting together comments for the Climate Action Council and I wonder whether you might be able to include that recommendation for DEC in them. Ooh, I, I can do something else. The, the Climate Action Council deadline for comments has been extended till to what, July? July 1, I think it is. July now. 1, so before the holiday. Um, so what I would like to do is share my uh, comments 
I haven't worked on them for the last month. I can add something about DECN. We can, we can chat about that a bit. And I'd like to share them with people and request that if you uh, read the comments and you feel good about them, that you copy and paste and email them in. They're too long to be, to be sent via the portal. Um, or you take uh, any provisions that we're recommending and put them uh, in your comments, especially the closure of the 10 incinerators. That is, is front and center. We cannot be, um, have, have um, we can no longer rationalize having disposal methods that are highly toxic and air polluting um, and produce greenhouse gases and are in environmental justice communities for the most part. I mean, what more, what other things? Yeah, anyway. They're ugly. That's another yes, thing. Yeah. And they stink. <laughs> Okay, so, I think we're going to wrap it up <clears throat> there and um, and we'll be following up in the future, but at this point, we're just going to end tonight. Well, I think that's a good idea. So thank you, everyone, for sticking around and thank you. Um, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much, Tracy, okay. for your excellent presentation. Yeah. And thank you for coming, everybody else. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Good night. Good night.